If you only watch the golf club, could you tell if she hit the ball? Can you tell if it's a hit or a strike? The action is too fast for us to see, even in slow motion. But if you tracked and carefully measured the speed, there would be an impact or jolt that would show a momentary deceleration the very instant the ball was hit. It doesn't matter if the motion is horizontal or falling like this hammer. Whatever hits a stationary solid object must experience some jolt the instant it hits. It also doesn't matter what angle it hits the object or if the object is crushed into smaller pieces, the speed of the object doing the hitting must momentarily decelerate in accordance with the laws of momentum. Conservation of momentum is a fundamental law of physics. So what do the fundamental laws of physics have to do with the events of 9-11? Everything. Most people don't realize that the Twin Towers did not experience any jolts as they fell. Careful measurements such as this one by David Chandler clearly indicates that the velocity of the roof of the towers uniformly sped up. How can this be? How can the roof of the towers uniformly accelerate with no jolts if it hit or crushed the undamaged structure below? The National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, or NIST, was tasked with investigating the event. They conducted some experiments but NIST did not use them because the results did not support a fire-induced gravity collapse. Instead, they resorted to a computer model to prove their desired result, but will not release their model data for verification. They stopped their study the moment collapse began, simply stating global collapse ensued. In other words, they just assumed that collapse was inevitable. But in science, one needs to be very careful when making such bold assumptions. Instead, NIST refers to the work of Professor Bazant and others with their mathematical collapse analysis. To explain the energy needed, their hypothesis relies on the notion that the upper block of floors physically crushed the lower floors into dust. They claim the upper, smaller block of the towers crushed the larger, lower block down to the ground, and then the upper block finally crushed itself. In addition, they said that the crush down and crush up cannot occur simultaneously. They say we simply cannot see this falling block behind all the dust. But independent physicists and engineers have refuted the official hypothesis with their own research papers. They point out that there is no deceleration or jolt, and any structure that is dropped in a larger structure would destroy itself before it could destroy all the lower structure. Therefore, the towers could not have collapsed due to gravity alone. Newton's third law of motion says that for every action, there is an opposite but equal reaction. So any force imparted by a falling block striking a lower structure must also impart the same force on the upper block. What the independent scientists are really saying is that an additional force such as explosive must have removed the supporting structure, allowing the roof to constantly speed up so as not to experience any jolts and providing the energy needed to destroy the structure below. Obviously, both hypotheses cannot be correct. So how can we tell who is not correct? By conducting some experiments, the arbitrator of opposing hypotheses. Richard Feynman was a brilliant physicist and a member on the panel that investigated the Challenger disaster, who conducted a simple experiment using ice water to demonstrate the effect of temperature on a piece of the shuttle's seal. He said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So let's observe some simple experiments to help resolve this conflict. Both towers held the upper blocks of floors for about one hour after the planes hit, meaning the total supporting force must be equal to the downward weight of the floors. The goal of the first experiment is to see if there is a deceleration by a falling body by any structure that once supported the static weight. A wood block was gently wedged so that it just barely held the upper block in the static condition. Raising the block and dropping it, you can clearly see a jolt as the upper block hits the lower. The goals of the following experiments are, is there a jolt when an upper structure impacts a lower structure or will the falling part uniformly accelerate? Can the upper structure destroy a lower structure without destroying itself in the process? Or is the crush down of the lower part simultaneous with the crush up of the upper part, 
contrary to the official hypothesis. I constructed a rail system in order to guide a falling hollow concrete block onto a stack of four similar concrete blocks. The concrete block was raised to the 12 foot mark, equivalent to the floor spacing on the twin towers and let go. Just like the towers, the falling block did not hit the lower block squarely, but unlike the towers, the falling block obviously experienced a jolt after it hit the lower stack. In addition, both the falling block and the top block of the stack were destroyed virtually simultaneously in accordance with Newton's third law. However, it did not destroy the underlying supporting blocks. The test was repeated with the same blocks, only this time the holes in the blocks were alternated to see if a change in the support structure would make any difference. Similar results were observed. Finally, some very small weak blocks were used. The results were identical, however, due to the lack of support from the guide rails, the stack tipped over, but after they yielded the same results. The next three experiments are real-world examples intended to see if indeed, as NIST simply assumed, collapse was inevitable. Will collapse of these structures continue to accelerate, and is collapse really inevitable? Based on these three real-world examples, an accelerating straight-down collapse of the structures certainly was not inevitable. In part two, we will compare a natural gravity building collapse with a known controlled demolition and show how, with careful measurements, you can tell the difference. In part one, we conducted some experiments to demonstrate what happens when something falls onto a similar structure that once supported it. So is it possible to have a total gravitational collapse of a structure? Yes. The French use a demolition system that uses gravity to take down a building called Varinage. This system is suitable for masonry structures, but not for steel frame structures like the Twin Towers. Notice the following as you watch. First, notice that it is pulled from about the center of the structure and uses Newton's third law to destroy both the top and the bottom simultaneously. Second, notice how you can follow the roof lines just about all the way down, unlike the Twin Towers. Third, notice that there is a clear, definite drop first and then a puff of debris as the upper block impacts the lower floor, but not any ripples or puffs first, followed by the drop. Fourth, careful measurements of the speed has confirmed that indeed there is a jolt or deceleration the moment the top block hits the floor below. This is an example of a true gravity collapse. Finally, notice the falling mass stayed within the building footprint impacting the floors below, unlike the Twin Towers, where much of the mass was thrown outward and never even impacted the lower tower at all. How about a known controlled demolition? It looks about the same, but it is not, for explosives are used to assist the fall. Notice the puffs of smokes about the same time as the initial drop. And while I cannot say for sure that all controlled demolitions will not experience a jolt, I can say that all gravity collapses must experience a jolt in order to follow physical laws. World Trade Center 7 was never hit by an airplane, but it fell late on September 11th. It not only accelerated without any jolt whatsoever, but remarkably it fell at total free fall for over 100 feet of its fall. This means that some other force had to have removed all supports virtually simultaneously, moving them out of the way or it would not accelerate freely. A fire-induced progressive global collapse as claimed by NIST is totally impossible because it defies the laws of physics. There is a reason why NIST removed three times from their draft report the phrase that indicated that their analysis was consistent with physical principles before issuing their final report. By removing this phrase, in effect, their conclusion of the world's first case of thermal expansion leading to a progressive global collapse does not follow the fundamental laws of physics and is therefore wrong. My experiments are simple, but like Feynman's ice water used for the space shuttle, they demonstrate fundamental principles. The media, the government, and the so-called experts are lying about 9-11, playing us as fools. But the laws of physics cannot be fooled, nor do they care what everybody thinks or says. What was demonstrated by experiment is, one, there is a jolt when the upper structure impacts a lower structure and a naturally falling block will not uniformly accelerate. Two, 
the upper structure will not destroy a lower structure without destroying itself in the process. And three, the crush down of the lower structure can be virtually simultaneous with the crush up of the upper structure, contrary to the official hypothesis. The fact that the upper block of the World Trade Center was observed to uniformly speed up cannot be explained with a natural gravitational collapse. Since the NIST explanations do not match their own experiments, it's wrong. Since Professor Bazant's hypothesis does not match experiment, it's wrong. And since the NIST assumption that collapse is inevitable does not match reality, it's wrong. What you are observing are rapidly timed explosives blowing out the supporting structure, allowing the roof to accelerate. Explosives also accounts for all other evidence found, such as the eutectic steel found by FEMA, the iron microspheres found by the USGS, and the high explosive active nanothermite found in the dust, none of which were addressed by NIST. The controlled demolition hypothesis where both the upper and lower part of the towers were destroyed with rapidly timed explosives is the only explanation that can be supported by experiment it matches all known evidence and the laws of physics. Dismissive arguments such as, who would have put the explosives there? Why was it done? Or statements like, somebody would have talked, simply cannot trump the fundamental laws of physics of what must have happened. So how can you tell if it's a natural gravity collapse? Simple, just look for the jolts. If there are no jolts, then it's not a natural gravity collapse. And if it's not a natural gravity collapse, then it's a man-made demolition. And if it's a man-made demolition, then it was planned before 9-11. And if it was planned before 9-11, then something is very, very wrong. And finally, if you think I'm wrong, then prove me wrong with experiments. Fortunately for the real terrorists, the average person is just not comfortable with questions about 9-11, and they dismiss the physics as just a conspiracy theory or ignore it completely, not wanting to get involved. Or, like in the time of Galileo, they laugh and ridicule those who do know, and in fact are helping to cover the crime of the century. But real Americans are not afraid to ask legitimate questions about what really happened to our fellow citizens. Always remember the thousands of people that were intentionally murdered and the unnatural acceleration of the towers that defy the law of physics without assistance from explosives each time 9-11 is mentioned as another excuse to take away your freedoms or justify another war.